Jerzy Kukoczka was a high altitude climber from Poland. He is widely considered one of the greatest climbers of all times. In the mid 1980s, he won the crown of the Himalayas in Karakoram when he became the second man in history to climb all 14 8000ers. He achieved this remarkable feat on the 18th of September 1987 when he climbed Shisha Fangma. Just 11 months after Reinhold Messner and despite the obvious economic hardship Poland was enduring under communist rule in less than 8 years. Ambitious, fineering and innovative, Kokochka opened 9 new routes and 8000 others. 5 climbs in alpine style and 4 in winter. But he had more than the challenge of the climb on his plate. He was a poor miner, leaving behind the iron curtain of communist Poland. Despite having achieved the most major successes in the world of mountaineering, life had different plans for Kokochka as he went on to pursue bigger goals. Kokochka's main interest lay in the unclimbed south base of Lutsi. A challenge described by many as impossible, and he took it as a challenge to be able to do what no one else had done. Lutse was a special mountain in the life of Yerusha Kokoschka. It was there that he began his Himalayan career on the 4th of October 1979, and lost his life there 10 years later. Although Kokochka climbed Lutse without supplemental oxygen, it was also the only one of the 14 8000ers whose summit he reached both outside winter season and without establishing a new route. It is easy to understand that the ambitious climber wanted to correct, as it were, his already spotless achievement by carving a new route on the intimidating, unclimbed south pace. The south face of Lutse was one of the key problems of Himalayan mountaineering during the 1970s and 80s, and there were regular attempts to reach the summit from that side. Prior to 1989, Polish climbers also tried to establish a Polish route on the south pace, causing the deaths of two Polish climbers, Rafal Cholda and Chazwap Yakyal. In 1885, Kokochka took part in one of those expeditions. The wall is one of the most difficult ones in the Himalayas. 3,000 meters of demanding terrain with difficulties growing with height. It was considered the biggest challenge for Himalayan climbers of the 20th century. The best climbers in the world face it. In the spring of 1989, Reinhold Messner organized an international expedition to the south face of Lutse. He invited the stars of Himalayan mountaineering, including Shishtaf Vileski and Arthur Heiser, into the team. Kukochka did not receive an invitation, who, like the Italian, had conquered all 14 8000ers. Messner passed him over. It seemed that Kokochka fell bad in that situation. Initially, Kokochka wanted to traverse Kanchunchunga, but then the Russians got it, for they traversed it from left to right, or the other way around, diagonally and across, with dozens of porters, climbers, fixed camps, gear, and food. At first, Kokochka wanted to re-traverse Kanchinchunga in favor Alpine style. But when he heard that Messner's team would draw from the Lurse south face, he decided to attempt to climb that wall instead. On Lurse, 
Years ago, Kuchka wanted to achieve something great, something that no one else had achieved at that time. He wanted to climb Lutse via a new route, by forcing the formidable south face, the wall that has killed so many. Finally, in the fall of 1989, Kokochka organized an expedition himself, but it almost did not take place. On the 27th of May that year, five Polish mountaineers, all Himalayan veterans, Yogenosh Krobak, Miroswap Dasal, Miroswap Garjileski, Andrzej Heinrich, and Wak Abu Otremba, lost their lives on the Lola Foss near Everest. This marked the beginning of the decline of the Polish ice warriors. Back then, the tragedy jeopardized Kokochka's expedition to the Lord Sea South Pass, as many climbers resigned from taking part in the expedition. Unfortunately, because the team and the goal had to be rearranged quickly, the organization of the expedition did not follow the well-tried practices of forced expeditions. At the end of August 1989, the team flew to Kathmandu. It included Yerja Kokochka, Richard Falaski, Richard Veraki, Maciej Faulokowski, Shamizwaf Fisaski, and Tomasz Kofes. Apart from those, there was a radio telegrapher, Lashak Jir, Dr. Mihao Kolai, and a journalist, Eshbeta Fetak from Kativessa Regional Television. Altogether, there were 14 people. The venture was an international media event and television crews from Poland, Italy and Switzerland followed the expedition all the way to the base camp. The climbers were very often tired and irritated with the presence of cameras. The team stayed at base camp for almost two and a half months. At the end of that stay, when the route was ready, Kokochka suggested to Falaski and Fisaski that they go with him on the attempt, but nobody wanted to. When he talked to Richard Falaski, he proposed a new variant of the route. It would still have been a big challenge had they followed the already preferred route. They went up because the weather suddenly turned. It should be added that at that time there were no such precise forecasts as climbers can use today. They were also in contact with Mexican climber Carlos Carcillo who climbed Lurce from the other side and said that if they had any problems after reaching the top, when going down, he would leave them a tent on the other side of Lurce on the normal route that Kokochka and Falaski knew, with food and aid and a burner for cooking. After two days, Kokochka and Falaski reached the camping site on the south base of Lurse. It was the third camp, which was probably at an altitude of about 7,600 meters above sea level. There, they ate and rested. The weather was good. It stopped blowing. After enduring months of bad weather, the highly anticipated weather window arrived and the two made rapid progress up the mountain. They made a bio walk at around 8,200 meters and continued only the next day in perfect weather. The summit was just a few hundred meters away. On the 24th of October, Kokochka and his partner, Richard Falaski, set up from Camp 5 to attempt the summit. They used an 80-meter-long thin roof for belaying. 
Such a rope is usually used in rocks. However, they were aware that even such a thin rope could give them a sense of security. And at that altitude, every gram mattered. They set up with that version of billing. They both knew that they could either take a risk in climbing a stretched single rope or climbing a folded rope and do 40 meter fetches, which would have been increased the climbing time at least twice. It was a conscious risk, but it is known that in such mountains nothing can be achieved without risk. Kokochka was the first to go. Falaski belayed him. Kokochka was leading a fetch at an altitude of about 8,300 meters. They had already overcome the most difficult section. It seemed that they would reach the summit without much trouble. The rope was stretched for about 70 meters. Only a few meters were left to an easy place. Kokochka had already moved far away from Velaski and was not visible. The terrain was difficult and the rope moved slowly. When Kokochka approached the middle rip of the wall, where the main difficulties ended, there was an accident. What was the cause? A broken grip, a stone falling from above, a leg slipping out of the step or something else. We will never know. The line couldn't stand a powerful jerk. The rock flat was covered with snow. Kokochka began to slide down. It seemed that he would to stop on the first belay. To Falaski's horror, the first belay didn't work. The second should work, but they jumped out all, and Kokochka gained more and more momentum. At some point, it was no longer just sliding, but normal flight. He began to bounce up the rocks. Falaski didn't hear any of his screams. All he could do then was to call up inside himself, because he knew that in a moment he was going to feel a huge jolt. Dumbstruck, he was wondering if he was about to be pulled out from his position as well. Suddenly, he felt a huge jerk. It threw him on the wall, and in a moment there was a slag. It turned out that the rope broke somewhere on a sharp edge. He only saw Kokochka flying into the abyss, 3,000 meter deep. For a few moments, he could still hear the sound of Kokochka's ice axe bouncing off the rocks. He could see his red mitten falling slowly down. Falaski was left alone. He had no opportunity to inform the base game about the tragic accident because Kokochka fell together with the radio telephone. The base game couldn't see what was going on up because the location of the wall he was climbing made it impossible. Pulaski had to save his own life and he started descending. Although it was not easy and a difficult, often vertical terrain. At some points, he used the fax ropes that were laid there. He also had a piece of rope that he had cut off, so that he could slide down some short vertical points, if possible. In the evening, from a distance, he saw his tent left at an altitude of about 7,600 meters. It was getting dark, so he took out the headlamp. But somehow he nudged it with his hand and it fell off his helmet. And he was left alone in the dark. He didn't dare go further towards the tent, even though it was close by and on level ground but the slab was covered with snow. So he stayed until morning. Their colleagues were already concerned at the base game. They watched what was happening on the wall and saw that one person was descending. 
and they were absolutely convinced that it was Kokochka. Although it's known that no one wished anything bad to anyone. Finally, Falaski reached the tent and after some time his colleagues reached him. After the tragic accident, Richard Viraki sent Fifal to check if Kokochka's body was by the wall. Despite the search, the body of 41-year-old Yerusha Kokochka, one of the greatest alpinists of all times, has never been found. Although after returning from the expedition, its members said that they had buried Kokochka's body in a rock crack. But this information was important only for the family. It was never really found. At that time, if the body was not found, it was only after a year that all procedures and formalities related to death could be started. The death of Yerusha Kokochka was a great blow to Polish climbing community. The flourishing of Polish Himalayan mountaineering came to an abrupt end in 1989. The deaths of Yoganush Krobak, Miroslav Dzal, Miroslav Garjileski, Andrzej Heinrich, and Wak Abu Otremba on Everest, and the sad demise of Yerusha Kokochka on Lursi set the end of the golden decade of Polish Himalayan mountaineering. All six victims were experienced Himalayan climbers. Murua, communism and fallen collapsed in 1989 and state funding decreased as a result. Though the money could be replaced, the loss of several key ice warriors could not. Kokochka was such an iconic climber that his death shocked and depleted the entire community. There were many foolish climbers during the 1980s, but their success relied heavily on the leadership of a few. Kokochka was certainly one of these leaders, as were all five who perished on Everest. Momentum halted in the wake of these deaths. There were a few climbers who remained active in the Himalaya, but the golden decade was over. With a bit of luck, Kokochka and Falaski could have been the first conquerors of the then great Himalayan goal. Though Kokochka's life was cut short in 1989 at the age of only 41, his legacy remains among the laws of adventure and mountaineering all around the world. Kokochka's legacy, though, is not to be found in the worst quantity of rules. The speed of his climbs in the famous Himalayan crown accolade, but instead in the pristine quality of his essence. His memory will remain forever with those who climb mountains. Finally, a new route on the south base of Lourdes was established on the 16th of October 1990, when Sergei Birshov and Vladimir Karataev of Russia reached the summit from the south using supplemental oxygen. Despite poor weather and avalanches, they worked their way up the route. Six camps were established on the face. The crux was from Camp 4 and up to the top. The ridges were dangerously cornished. On the 16th of October, Sergei Birshov and Vladimir Karataev left Camp 6 at 7 a.m. In 12 hours, they climbed the extremely difficult ridges and arrived on the summit at 7 p.m., already in the dark. It took them until 5 a.m. to descend to Camp 6. They had spent six days above 8,000 meters and were totally exhausted. 
three of their companions had to climb up and join them for the descent since they were incapable of descending by themselves. It was a daring rescue. It took them five days to descend even with the fixed roofs. Karataev was more dead than alive. Seven of the Soviet climbers suffered severe frostbite with probable amputations. It is worth mentioning that the same year Slovenian mountaineer Tomo Sison claimed climbing the South Pace. But his achievement is generally perceived as an unlikely one because of the lack of photographs from the summit and the climbers' incoherent reports. Thank you all so much for watching.